<clears throat> as you can see from the slide behind me, and as my presentation skills earlier may have indicated, I have no idea what I am doing, all right? What you are seeing right now, the dude who wrote a book, the dude who's had the startups, I'm now 30, all right? And this is going on eight years of still not knowing what I am doing. But what you see on stage, what you're going to see on stage a little bit later from one of your fellow alums, is that final or, or sort of later stage version of ourselves, okay? <laughs> we really, really did not know what we were doing when we got started. And that's okay because it turns out this kind of ignorance and this kind of freedom is actually really, really valuable. Now, normally I make fun of a school's mascot. Uh, I mean, why, why no mascot? We can, we can discuss this later. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything disparaging about your founder. Uh, awesome beard. Really, how could I? I... I am envious of this thing, and, and, and true story, I don't know if any of you watched The Verge, uh, a gentleman there, Josh Topolsky, who, who kind of runs the show, uh, he and I are getting into a beard off, and I promised him I would not shave, this is the start of the college tour, so I would not shave my beard until New Year's, and we would have a competition for who has the best groomed beard. The winner would uh, make a significant donation to the loser's favorite charity, and I aspire to Mr. Cooper's facial hair. We'll see, we'll see. Um, so everything that I've been involved with for the last three years, like I said, still not really know what I'm, what I'm doing, uh, has involved cute mascots because I love them. They are uh, fun things to draw. And uh, when building a consumer brand, it's a nice way to build a, a relationship with people because even though technology comes in a really shiny package, right? We love our iPhones. We all love our Samsung gears. Any? No, none of you. Okay. One, one of you. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, we are ultimately still using technology that is soulless, and we are seeing how important design is, not just when it comes to mascots, but when it comes to user experiences. And more and more every day, New York City happens to be on the cutting edge of that because so many people consider this and take this so seriously. Again, it doesn't have to be cute logos, but I like them. Um, and you know, I came and wanted, I really wanted the Cooper Union subreddit to, uh, throw questions at me so that I could answer them in this 25-minute keynote. Unfortunately, uh, it's not the most active subreddit. Um, I don't know if you guys just don't like the site. And if you do, that's fine. That's fine. I, I hate to say it, but it was uh, not a great turnout. But I can very quickly answer a few things. One, I am Team Orange Red. If you don't know what that means, you probably get a lot of work done. Oh, some periwinkles in the crowd. <laughs> Some periwinkles. Well, how does it feel to be a loser? Um, <clears throat> yeah, shots, shots fired. All right. Um, the biggest challenges that we faced during the launch of Reddit, I'm going to get into a bit later. Um, and then, oh yeah, a couple other things about when we realized uh, that Reddit was going to get big. Um, again, remember, there is a lot less foresight. I know the story seems really simple, right? They start this thing. It's a success. Look at that. It's not true. There are so many failures along every path of success. And unfortunately, every one of us, for the last however many years we've been in education, have been taught to avoid failure. Uh, and so we end up seeing the final product on stage saying, look at that, great time. Um, but in fact, lots of failing, lots of it. And so one of the best things you can do right now while you are still in school is take these kinds of small chances that I'm going to talk about a little bit later and get used to it. Get used to putting something out there and the world just being like, yeah, okay, let me go back to my cat photos. But we'll, we'll get into this. Um, Tom Friedman, a man with not so impressive facial hair and a book, sorry, Tom, and a book uh, that lies. Uh, the world is obviously not flat. Um, we've checked into this, but the World Wide Web is. And, and this was something that had dawned on me over the last few years as not only a catchy thing to say, but also something that tied to so much of what was changing because it is now both the world's greatest stage and library in one. And that is a bread pig, if you can't tell, holding a book and a microphone representing those two things. See, here's what's cool, all right? Yeah, you always look for a chance to use a Bane reference in a talk, all right? Always. If you can fit Bane in, you're doing it, you're doing it right, all right? I know, I know. If you guys have been listening, paying attention to the media, uh, you, you know the situation right now in the economy, in the economy, in the economy is not great, okay? But there are so many incumbents right now who are trying so hard and so desperately 
to understand the internet. And yet, as Bain puts it, they merely adopted it. All right, one of the few, and, and I think, and I, I'm willing to argue, mo more pivotal and probably strongest advantages that we have is that we were born in it, we were molded by it, some of us were raised by it, and this platform is native to us in a way that it is simply not. In the same way that if you grow up in France, you are going to understand France, French culture, the French language far better than someone who even spends all 40 years of their life doing it from the States. Uh, and it's also really nice to use a Bain quote. I'm not allowed to do Bain impressions in public anymore, uh, mostly because uh, my girlfriend says I look foolish. Um, but this is usually how we feel when we see the incumbents trying to adapt. We want to face palm because they don't get it. They don't understand, and that's okay because it presents an amazing opportunity for the rest of us, and I want to talk about one of my favorite ones, all right? <laughs> Hyperbole and a Half, amazing. I think, I think her book is about to drop in a week or so, and you guys should all check it out. If you don't know this webcomic, it's, it's amazing. Now, there are lots of people. Now, I am a very proud member of the New York tech community. I love, love this tech community. I actually lived in San Francisco for two long, seasonless years where, yes, the burritos were better. I'm sorry, I will concede that, but nothing else. No, uh, you know, we started Reddit in Boston in a tiny little apartment in Medford, Massachusetts. Uh, so it's not really, it's not just outside of Boston, it's outside of Cambridge, which is outside of Somerville, which is Medford. Uh, we were in a tiny little apartment after we graduated from UVA in 2005. Steve and I were in the first round of Y Combinator. And back then, it was just this crazy idea that Paul Graham and his friends were starting. Today, of course, it's a really well-known and amazing accelerator. It's produced companies like Dropbox and Airbnb and Reddit. Uh, but it did so with investments of less than $15,000 each. They basically said, live like grad students for a summer. Here's enough to pay bills, buy some servers, eat some pizza, and build something in those three months that we can convince investors will be worth billions one day. And you look at companies like Dropbox and Airbnb, and they are indeed multi-billion, with a B, dollar companies started by recent college graduates who did not know what they were doing and had laptops and internet connections. In fact, how many of you use Dropbox? This is fun, of course we all. We cannot imagine life without Dropbox. Started in a bus station. All right, if you don't know this, spread the word. Uh, because Drew Houston was the guy who would like show up at Y Combinator dinners and, uh, and, and, and tease. He was working on this dead-end SAT prep company. And we all thought, this guy is so smart. He's, he like, he's going to figure it out. He just needs to get off this whole SAT prep thing. And he was in South Station in Boston waiting for a bus, probably to take him to New York, because obviously you're going to come down to New York. And he left his thumb drive at home, so he couldn't work on his dead-end SAT prep startup. I guess he didn't know that then. But at that moment, he thought, this is stupid. This is dumb. I should have an effortless way to sync all my files in one place. And on that bus... <laughs> He started working on Dropbox, a company in less than a decade, in, what, six years? A room full of people cannot live without. And that is awesome. But this is, this is a glimpse into what we can do. And before we go rushing off and thinking, up, oh, disrupt all the industries, we need to keep something very important in mind. And I brought this up at the beginning. I'm going to keep going back to it. We're going to hear early days stories to, I think, humanize one of your own who's had tremendous success online. But this, and you know, if I had more foresight, I would have asked you for a photo of yourself while you were an undergrad, because this is the first photo of me and Steve as founders of Reddit in 2005. Wide-eyed, I got my Cafe Press Reddit shirt on, <laughs> rocking my UVA cap. I, uh, I gotta say, uh, we really had no idea. <laughs> really, really, and that's, it's actually an asset. It is actually an asset because you really don't know what you're getting yourself into, and that's okay. <laughs> starting something, no matter what the entrepreneurial venture is, and that's not just starting a startup, that's launching your first Kickstarter, that's opening your first Etsy store, that's starting your first Tumblr blog, requires some amount of effort. It requires you to actually say, all right, I don't care if it's embarrassing, I'm going to put it out there. I just want to try, I just want to ship, I just want to launch. This is the first version of Reddit that we launched. And I say this not just to embarrass ourselves right here at a wonderful design school, but also to show two things. One, 
this is our minimum viable product. This was the first version of Reddit we put online and shared with the world maybe a month, about three weeks after we graduated from college. And, I mean, you can look at it. We don't even have upvotes and downvotes. We had a couple of submissions. It was just me and Steve. We're only, only the two people using the damn thing. You'll also notice that Steve is a jerk because I have negative <laughs> one karma. He died, and I knew who did it. We had just launched. <laughs> He was not fooling anyone. I knew. And, and I looked across the table and I said, you're a jerk. You're a jerk, Steve. And then we played World of Warcraft. Uh, this was, that's true, we both hit level 60 that summer. I know some of you are rolling your eyes because I know level caps are so much higher now. The game's changed. Listen, back in 05, we hit 60. We were very proud. We actually put it away. We put away World of Warcraft because we were starting a company and we couldn't be playing WoW all the time. But this is how it started. This is it. Like, this is pathetic. I, I mean, I would be ashamed, frankly. Fortunately, the design game, the startup game, has improved so much in the last eight years that I would be ashamed to launch this today. Um, but that's okay. That's okay because that's how it has to begin. Even something that starts like this can, eight years later, have 80 million users a month. 80 million people come to Reddit every month, which is bigger than there are people in France. And that is crazy. And Reddit's not even the biggest success of this last decade. But they all started the same slightly embarrassing way. They just had to be better than this. This is your nemesis. Again, whether you want to start a startup or create the, best, create the next candy crush, in which case, please do, because I'm still stuck on level 79. And it, no, I'm serious. I don't have my phone on me because that's, that's poor form, but I'm still stuck on that fucking level, and it's really pissing me off. So you want to create... Wait, I mean, are you, guys, you guys have heard of Candy Crush, right? Apparently they're IPOing, too. It's, it's amazing. Um, seriously, though, level 79, if anyone can help. It's been pissing me off for a week. Um, so whether you want to create an app, whether you want to create your first uh, Etsy store, again, all, all of these things require just being better than that. And that's, that's a, a great little tidbit I learned from Paul Graham, who simply said, listen... On the internet, you can't get away with not being something people want. Make something people want. Think about that with every single thing you produce in the world, and you'll be coming from a very good place. Because there are lots of cute cat photos online. There are lots of them. In fact, that's a photo of my cat. Her name is Karma. She is two and a half years old, and I take too many photos of her. Um, right? The internet is full of distractions, and that's why it's so important. Again, no matter what it is you're creating, to be better than that, but it is possible. And it forces us to step up our game and be as good as we can. Now, <clears throat> I want to convince you guys, if you're not already, the internet is great, it is not a fad, and it is better, better than what we had before in a world of gatekeepers. And I want to do this with a great story. It does involve San Francisco, but please just let it slide for a minute, okay? <clears throat> There was a young artist who lived in Seattle, Washington. And he loved, 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 loved doodling, but he needed to pay the bills, so he was working at the ASPCA. And he loved animals. He loved animals so much that it actually was really hard working at the ASPCA because you'd have to deal with all of the people who are such assholes to pets. And so it got to him, and he started going back into his art and focusing on that and trying to find ways to make a living from that because he didn't want to always have to be dealing with horrific humans uh, and at the ASPCA. So he starts publishing. And of course, this was 20, 25 years ago, uh, maybe even a little longer. Uh, and, and he starts publishing uh, at the local newspaper. And they say, you know what? We like what you're doing. All right, we'll give you a spot. Now, I, I, none of you probably actually know what a newspaper is. Um, <clears throat> Should have, I should have stopped myself. So every day, uh, this periodic would show up uh, made out of dead trees, and it would show up in people's homes. <laughs> and in the morning, they would look through it, and there was a section that I always loved. I'm dating myself now. There was a section I always loved. Uh, it was the comic section. And it was really at the discretion of that editor uh, to decide which comics were in there, right? It was, it was really up to them to decide, okay, this is good. And for some reason, they still will not get rid of Family Circus, which is beyond me. But, but let's just let's set that aside for a moment. So he started making a little bit of money because he started getting syndicated from that Washington newspaper. And, uh, and then he went on vacation. He went to San Francisco. And it was a really fortuitous trip because when he was down there, he went and talked to the Chronicle and said, listen, 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 I got this comic. I'd love to make a little bit more money if you guys would syndicate it too. And the, the editor said, all right, all right, this looks good. Let's do it. Goes back to Seattle. and He's thrilled. He's like, I can take over. I can have this empire. And uh, he gets a note from the Seattle newspaper, the one that first took a chance on him, and they said, listen, it's a little too controversial. It's a little too upsetting. We're going to have to pull your comic. I'm really sorry. 
but uh, it's just it's upsetting too many people, and, and we're just not comfortable running it. So this was a really, really fortuitous vacation, right? Because otherwise, there's a very good chance he would have just gone back to the ASPCA, kept working that job, and the world would have never had Gary Larson. Now, imagine a world without Gary Larson, right? That is a sadder, <laughs> much less awesome world. And fortunately, fortunately, he got lucky enough that one particular gatekeeper said, all right, fine, fine, fine. At the same time, another one was about to shut it on him. And I think about this, and I use this as such a great example, because comics have changed so much. This one particular niche has changed so much in the last 10 years, simply by virtue of the fact that no one needs to care about what some editor in some comic section thinks about your webcomic. If you want to do a webcomic with these crude stick figure drawings and make math jokes, you can start XKCD, and you can become the most popular webcomic in the world. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing, and you feel this good knowing that there is that much awesomeness in the world, just like this cat, there's that much more awesomeness in the world because someone like Randall Monroe can just start. And there are countless webcomic artists who have simply been able to just start and talk about things that might be a little contentious or a little controversial or maybe even a little too nerdy and thrived. Like, I mean, the, the unsexiest way to talk about this is simply just supply meeting demand. And it's so cool when it happens because these are people who are now making their livings, giving away content every day, right? They are giving away their content every single day, and they've adapted business models around it. Anytime you hear people complaining uh, about not wanting to adapt, you should, you should raise a skeptical eyebrow. Um, and there are plenty of industries that don't, but I, I will not delve into that here. I want to keep this uplifting. This, is, uh, uh, this has been a privilege to do. I, I am on a show called Small Empires on the Verge, and we profile startups in New York Tech. There's five episodes, five more coming. You should watch them. But it's given me a glimpse into this. It's given me a glimpse into the variety of startups right here in New York. Not only the founders, and I, I get to talk to lots of founders. I'm really lucky as an investor and as a founder myself. I, you know, lots, of, lots of good times with founders. We're going to do that a little later. But I also get to talk to employees at startups. And it's so cool because I get to meet people who spent their entire childhood in life studying music, going to Juilliard, and then decided one day, you know what? Jazz isn't for me, I'm going to learn how to code. And they're now working at startups where they get to eat M&Ms and wear sandals all the time. Like, and they love what they do. It's amazing because I know right now the options are not what they promised us, right? Go to school, it'll be fine, there'll be jobs, and it's not quite there. But right now there are sectors that are hiring, we can't hire enough. This is why I made that comment earlier about developers. We can't hire enough developers in tech right now. Every single company that I advise, is about 100 uh, portfolio companies, they're all hiring developers right now. A number of them are hiring designers. History majors, it's a little tougher. But the reality is more and more new careers are not just getting started or not just being joined by people, but actually being created by them. And that's, that's what's so cool to me. Because now people are taking chances. And they may, seem, they may seem intimidating at first. One of my favorites is a story from here in New York from a guy who failed out of the University of Georgia. And he bounced around for a little bit. He was doing finance for a hot minute, hated his life, shocker, and moved up to New York because he'd always wanted to take photos. Now, he had no business taking photos. He didn't even actually have a camera. He had never done photography before. He just really liked the idea of taking some photos. And all of his friends and all of his family were like, you are crazy. Stop it. Don't do this. Why are you going to New York with no plan? You just want to take a bunch of photos. You are a crazy person. But he started a Tumblr. And he started this Tumblr and started taking photos. And he started telling stories. And every day he would take another portrait of another person. And it kept growing and growing and growing. And he, he got better at taking photos. He sucked by his own admission at first, but he kept getting better and better and better. Until eventually, he became Humans of New York. And Brandon actually has a book coming out in a couple weeks. I'm just hustling everybody's books. This guy is now one of the most viewed photographers in the world. Literally millions of people are looking at his photos every day. And a few years ago, he was a University of Georgia failure. 
A few years ago, everyone was telling him, you are crazy, you have no business taking photos, who are you taking photos? That is ridiculous, don't do it. And yet, with some luck, with some talent, with some drive, with all of those things, he is now where he is today. And in the span of a few years, he is being able to be awesome at scale. And that is great. It is amazing because for so long we have had human beings who maybe didn't take that fortunate trip to San Francisco like Gary did, who just didn't get to be as awesome as they could, who did not get to live up to their full potential. And while the internet is not perfect, I know it is not this magic wand, it is enabling people every single day to do the things that they want to do, to do what they are passionate about, and be awesome at it. And that's great because it's going to mean better things for all of us. But the thing you have to remember, I'm happy. I didn't test where the arrow was <laughs> ahead of time. I went with pure gut on this one. I was like, all right, arrow's going to be on that side. Um, and it's supposed to be pointing to me. I still have no idea. I think if anyone is truly honest with you, any expert, they should also admit, look, I'm still kind of figuring this out because if they're not, they are either lying or they are not trying hard enough, all right? That's the reality, all right? And so <laughs> we're all still trying to figure it out. And what is so cool is the only thing we know for certain is the internet is changing a lot, a lot of things, a lot of different industries. And in a lot of ways, the people who can be the disruptors, the people who are the ones actually creating and actually doing are going to be the ones dictating where it's going to go. And I really want, I mean, the reason you guys are the first of 75 universities is because I want you all to go do all of the awesome stuff. And I don't want you to wait until graduation. I want you to start now. And I want you to start whether it's becoming a photographer, becoming a writer, becoming a jeweler. I want you to start right now. And I want you to remember this so that I can also take lots of credit for it when you are a success, all right? I would give anything to have been the guy telling Brandon of Humans of New York that, like, I was the one who motivated him to start doing that. But sadly, I am not, all right? And so it is in that vein that I hope you guys found this motivation. I hope you found this entertaining. And, and look, I also remembered something, too. This is the start of a very long process of making lots of mistakes and dealing with the fact that there are lots of people before you who you may see and be like, wow, this person is so incredibly successful, I could never do this. And realize, no, actually, <laughs> there is no reason why you can't do this. And that's why at every single one of these stops, we've got an alum who is probably sitting in this theater. Is that reasonable? Probably, like at some point, in the same position and has now been able to do awesome stuff thanks to the internet. So like, if you can't, if you can't be motivated by me, that's fine. I will not take it personally. Um, well, maybe a little, but no, I won't take it personally. But if you can't be motivated by someone who was here doing this, uh, I don't know, perhaps, perhaps this is the wrong talk. Um, but I humbly ask that with all of your smartphones or web-enabled devices, because I hope you guys were tweeting during this, um, uh, that you consider dropping me an email at join at um, because I'm trying to build a tremendous resource for this whole generation of college students to, like I said, be awesome. I won't sell your email. It's not, I'm not, there's no spam. There's nothing like that. Um, this is just to become a part of the posse. And, uh, and I also have to apologize because I, I was hoping I would have a t-shirt cannon with a full CO2 canister in time for this. I have the t-shirt cannon. The CO2 canister is not full and the shirts are still in route. So I'm sorry. I will have to, I will send a care package to your organizers. Um, oh, and we'll do that later. Okay, so uh, now, I'm going to bring a guest up on stage. I think that's what these chairs are for. Yes, okay. But remember, go do awesome stuff. Do not wait. And we're gonna hear firsthand why you should have no excuses whatsoever because there is no reason why even more greatness as facilitated by the internet cannot be coming out of this room right here. So, thank you.